Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the East and West Learning Connections. I'm Yang Wang, your host tonight, and also the president of this nonprofit organization. Uh, we help people of different heritages uh, overcome cultural barriers and get connected. So we bring uh, learning, communicating, and volunteering opportunities to the public, especially to the immigrant community. Um, in Canada, uh, this land was first dwelled and built by indigenous people, but now people from all over the world have landed in this country, built it and make it home for everybody. It's a great country. Uh, it's full of nice people, full of hope, but we also have problems, uh, especially indigenous people, uh, racial minorities, they face more barriers to prosperity. So we need to work together and work hard to build for a better future for everybody. In May is our Asian Heritage Month, and we want to take this opportunity to celebrate the contributions Asians have made to the country. And tonight, we are very much delighted to have two distinguished Asian women as our guest speakers at our East and West Dialogue. And uh, they will share their stories, uh, they will share their experience and their observations, what uh, problems, barriers, and opportunities they have witnessed in Canada. Uh, Sing Si Lai is a city councillor for Scarborough North of Toronto. She came from Hong Kong many years ago. Uh, she has had extensive work experience in Toronto. Uh, she is a very good communicator and a doer full of initiatives. She became the first president of Toronto Real Estate Board. And because of her excellent community service, she has received numerous awards, including the uh, Duke of Edinburgh Silver Medal, the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal, uh, the Chinese Canadian Legend Inspiration Award, the Catalyst Award, and among many other honors. In 2018, she was elected to be the city councillor for Ward 23. Um, and our other guest speaker, Taliyat Shumali, came from Iran. She was a lawyer in Iran. Uh, she came here, completed a university study in University of Toronto and York University, has had uh, several degrees in English literature, uh, women's study, law, and she is now the Education and Community Engagement Manager at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. So this nonprofit organization promotes and protects the human rights and uh, freedoms of all Canadians. Uh, she also volunteers as a mentor at Toronto oh, Region oh, Employment Sorry, immigrant immigrants. Employment <laughs> Councils. I, I'm familiar with uh, their acronym. At, it's called TRIAC. Uh -huh. so they basically yeah. connect um, newcomers with old, uh, old, new, mm -hmm. old immigrants. <laughs> like Thank me. you. Yeah. yeah the, so she is the mentor at Toronto Region Immigrant uh, Employment uh, Council. And also she sits on the advisory board for uh, the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Um, she speaks English, French, and Farsi. And uh, Cynthia speaks English, Cantonese, Mandarin, and Hakka. So we have like two uh, linguists <laughs> with us. <laughs> thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, thank you for volunteering your time to come over, have dialogue with us. And uh, before I turn it over to you, uh, Talia, I will start with you, sure. um, and I want to thank our audience uh, coming from uh, various areas also. Uh, most of us, I believe, are Torontonians, but uh, we also have uh, people from Shanghai, and I believe uh, from Sydney, Australia, uh, maybe other areas. Um, just give us a sh shout. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, now I turn it over to you, Talia. Awesome. 
That's great. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is, it's my pleasure and honor to be with you today. I also read um, Council of Lies biography. I was very impressed and I was like, why did you want to have me in a panel with such an accomplished woman? But nevertheless, I'm here and I'm honored to be with you. Um, as Yang said, my name is Talia Shamali. Oftentimes, we Iranians have uh, very poetic names, and mine is no exception. Talia means first rays of the sun, uh, and it's a metaphor for someone who's always in front, who leads the way for the others. Big name to live up to, uh, for sure. Uh, my, last, my last name, Shamali, means someone that is from the north. My dad and his family were all born and raised in Gilan, a beautiful northern region next to the Caspian Sea. In this picture, you see a photo of a UNESCO heritage village called Mosule, a small ancient village dating back thousand years in the north, known for its unique architecture. Every house's roof is another person's yard. Despite my last name, I didn't grow up in this unique village or in the north actually, but I still very, feel very connected to the north and I visit the region whenever I go back to Iran. In fact, this picture was taken from our last trip back in 2017 by my husband. All right. Um, I grew up here in this, um, in the capital of Iran, in the city of Tehran, a city of 12 million people, chaotic, busy, loud, a city that never sleeps. Um, you see these magnificent mountains in this picture um, these tall mountains, um, the old infrastructure and the cars makes Tehran one of the most polluted city in the world. And yet to me, it is the most beautiful city. Uh, okay, not maybe not the most beautiful, but definitely the one that is closest to my heart. Um, I was born and raised in Tehran. I lived there for 27 years. I was three when the Iranian revolution happened. A five, uh, when an eight year long uh, war between Iran, Iran and Iraq started. I was 12 when I, was, when I lost my dad. I'm an only child and I grew up with my mom, a five feet woman who looked, looks incredibly small, but tough as a nail. Despite everything that was going on in the country and in our personal lives, and believe me when I tell you that um, a revolution, a war and a loss of a parent, it's not even a nugget of what has happened to us we still managed to get by. The circumstances uh, surrounding my father's death and the un unbelievable double standard that exists in Iran, uh, in the Iranian justice system, when it comes to women, um, Iranian women are not considered to be worthy of many things. Um, after my father died, my mother did not, did not become my uh, immediate guardian, even though she was very capable. In the absence of the father, your parental grandfather or a male relative becomes your guardian. And in my case, um, my uncle, who at the time was suffering from a severe depression, uh, became my guardian. My mom fought for my custody um, and in court, but wasn't successful. But at the end, after reading many codes and laws, we found loopholes and brought a motion to the court. I became my own guardian at the age of 13. Uh, basically a minor that was emancipated from her parents and was able to make big decisions about her own life. Apparently at 13 years old, running her own life is less scary than a middle-aged woman having custody, but this is what it is. Finding this loophole made me really interested in the law and justice. I realized that even within a seemingly hopeless system, you can still find and win some battles. I've ended up in law school. And uh, it was on my last year uh, of law school that I met my future husband. A month into knowing and dating him, he told me that he is immigrating to Canada with his mom and his younger sister. I confess that up to that point, I not, never even thought about Canada as a future destination. My goal was to finish law school, to go to Paris, to continue my studies. I even had my, my university in mind. Um, I have family in France and my second language is French. Uh, he moved to Toronto and we still continued our relationship uh, long distance. Um, we got married in 2000 when he came back for a visit and he sponsored me to come here. A process that took two and a half years due to mistakes that were made in Canadian embassy in Tehran at the time 
and a maze of bureaucracy surrounding that. At the end, a somewhat angry letter that we sent to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Ottawa and them intervening resulted in my immigration visa in 2002. So um, I arrived in Toronto in April 2002. Yes, I specifically chosen this icy picture of Toronto because it was freezing and it was that cold when I arrived. Like many other immigrants and newcomers, I couldn't wait to start my life here. So the next day, I went to the University of Toronto, uh, Toronto's law school, and said, what can I do to get into law school here? I was a lawyer back home, and I wanted to become a lawyer here. The woman was really confused and said, oh, you cannot practice law here because Iranian law is different and your degree is not accepted here. I said, I know, that's why I'm here. What steps should I take to become a lawyer? And she got even more confused. Uh, see, at the time, I didn't know that there are organizations that can help you get these types of information for free. They wouldn't give that kind of information in the airport. I also didn't know anyone of my background who studied law or was a lawyer in Canada. My English was also very basic. The lady sent me to another department and this went back and forth until I gave up and came home. It took me a couple of months of asking and looking for information. This is maybe it started it start of like using internet as a basis of information. So I used to go to libraries. Um, and I also had a minimum wage job at Indigo, $7.75 per hour at the time uh, with no benefits. And at the end, I decided to start all over again. I uh, went to university, got a bachelor's degree, at the same time, I started volunteering uh, around the city, something that I highly recommend to friends and families, newcomers, and my students. Uh, volunteer for a cause that you're interested in and be good at it. Take it as seriously as you take any paid position because you never know if it actually becomes your job. My volunteer experience led to one. I started volunteering for a violence prevention organization in Toronto and continued even though, uh, even through my master's degree and the birth of my first child. And unt until I landed a job with them in 2011. Because of my background and my volunteering experience, I realized that I'm not more interested in legal information and legal education than litigating, which basically means going to court and argue for cases. And I find myself um, doing a master's degree in law, feminism and public policy um, instead of, you know, actually a lawyer that goes to court on behalf of clients. Um, in my years working in the gender-based violence sector, I got to work on some really amazing projects. The picture you see here is uh, of a family law information for women campaign. Um, this project is designed to give women and women identified populations a basic understanding of their own rights when it comes to family law. Issues such as child custody, spousal and uh, child support, and uh, intersections of family law with other areas of law, um, like uh, criminal law, domestic violence, or immigration laws. The beauty of this legal information campaign is that not only is designed for women, the information is available in 14 languages, including simplified and traditional Chinese, Somali, Tamil, and Urdu. It is also available in multiple accessible formats, such as Braille or audio, and have customized legal information, materials for indigenous women, Muslim women, and so on. The heartbreaking reason um, behind campaigns such as this is that lawyers are incredibly expensive in this country. And oftentimes when families break down, women are the ones who cannot afford to get legal consultation or get a lawyer. They often have to make a hard decision between paying rent or putting food on the table or getting legal advice. So a high percentage of them um, uh, ended up, end up self-representing uh, in the court. These types of campaign are, um, are not, 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 they're not enough, but it's better than showing up in courts, not knowing what you're talking about. So they're designed in a way to empower women, uh, especially understanding the language, uh, understanding the legal information in their own language. So um, these types of projects um, and, and the other um, projects, to this types of projects and many other similar projects, I got to work with some incredible um, gr groups of people, um, in incredibly diverse 
um, people in Ontario. Um, and because of all these projects and all these works were community-based and the communities that we work with were involved uh, from the beginning, from choosing, producing, and delivering these legal information um, materials and workshops. These days, I work for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. This is a not-for-profit, non-governmental, and non-partisan organization in Canada, which protects and promotes fundamental rights and freedoms for all people in Canada. Fundamental rights such as freedom of mobility, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, privacy rights, and so on. Uh, that has been given to everyone in Canada, regardless of their immigration status. Our job is to monitor all the levels of the government, from federal to provincial to municipal governments across Canada, and see if they're passing any laws or if they're thinking about passing any laws that might limit our rights and freedom in this country in a way that is not fair to all of us or to some of us. CCLA is mostly known for its court cases. We regularly take the government to court, and um, right now, because of all the emergency orders that are being issued and being reissued across the country due to COVID, we've been busier more than ever. Our job is to read all these emergency orders, making sure that these limitations that are being put on our fundamental rights are fair, are justified, are based on science. And it is for what the government is claiming it is for us to, it is to protect us from a virus. But suing the government is not the only thing that CCLA does. Uh, to advance equality and justice in Canada. We're also big believers of education as well. And that's the area that I work for. Um, each year between the two of us in the education department, we talk to more than 14,000 community members and newcomers, refugees and immigrants and young people as young as kindergarten age children about their fundamental rights. What are the rights that they have in Canada? Perhaps like me, they come from a country that where these sets of rights were not available to them. We also talk to them about the importance of getting involved and protecting these rights through voting, through peaceful protest, or through advocating. We want them to not only think about their own rights, but also think critically about other people's rights. Oops. Um, I have the pleasure of traveling across Ontario and Canada when it's not a pandemic and provide information to people that gives them agency and options to take control of their lives. These workshops are free in Ontario and subject to funding in different provinces and for everyone who is interested. Many of these presentations I, I do are in French or in Farsi. I work with translators to provide workshops in different languages or to deliver them in American Sign Language, for example. Um, even when I'm not at work, I annoyingly provide information or talk to people. Uh, I'm not sure if it comes from my involvement with the justice system at the early age or struggling in my early years in Canada to find information and navigate my way. Anytime I am in the position to share information or if I think people might benefit from knowing something, I um, talk. I stand up and give information. The the picture that I lost was actually the first picture in my slide. And I wanted to end with saying that the way I see it, our rights and freedoms are kind of like this historic village that I showed you a picture of at the beginning. Um, everyone's backyard might be someone else's roof and freedom of no one is safe when freedom of some of, some of us are unsafe. So all of us have a duty or um, if we have a chance to stand up and defend other people's rights and freedom. Thank you all for listening to my story. Okay, so yeah, Tanya, I'm very curious about um, like the Iranian community here in mm -hmm. Toronto. So maybe later you can share with us Absolutely. some of your yeah. tradition and uh, uh, what's you know what is it like um, in the the Iranian community here, because um, um, yeah, that's uh, for me. I'm very curious. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and your experience, um, I wonder uh, what kind of uh, barriers uh, in addition to mm. that, uh, you know, lack of information, um, have you ever encountered uh, some like other barriers um, oh, absolutely. to your think, life here? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think for many people, I don't think that's a, um, that's a struggle that's unique to Iranian communities, but many people who speak English like me with an accent, 
Oftentimes we are overlooked or our knowledge has been questioned just because we have an accent. Um, and there are some stereotypes that coming in with being an Iranian woman, for some reason, uh, we, people think of us as, you know, very obedient or people who don't speak up, women who don't speak up, or, uh, you know, women who, um, you know, are very feminine. I, so um, for many of us, it's getting used to uh, being a racialized woman here and being someone who's a visible minority when you open your mouth. Some of us don't look that different or we look, uh, we pass. Um, so uh, it happens to me often when I enter a room, people automatically assume that, you know, I, I come from a certain class or um, because I have an accent, I don't know many things. Uh, especially when I'm among lawyers, believe it or not, many of them explain laws to me, like I have no idea, like basic legal things. And in reality, not only I'm used to the civil law system, the Iranian system, or the system that exists around the world, but also the common law system, because I'm deeply involved with this work, not in an educational level, but also with the cases. I'm the French spokesperson for the organization, and I do talk a, a lot about law. Um, so uh, the Iranian community here is also very diverse. Um, we, like many Iranian communities, um, you know, we force our children to educate themselves as much as possible. Uh, I do this with my children as well. And there's lots of pressure for you to become uh, doctors and uh, engineers. Um, lawyers are also getting some attraction because um, I think immigrant parents are realizing that lawyers make uh, lots of money, not, not lawyers like me who do uh, not-for-profit works. We are poor lawyers. Um, but um, I'm happy to say that, you know, it warms my heart to see that Iranian women, from the beginning, they formed a not-for-profit organization for themselves. We have the Iranian um, Association of Iranian Women uh, of Ontario, um, we also have like not for profit organization. My community came together by themselves. They raised $12 million to open a community center in Thornhill. And um, after that, they um, um, opened, opened the center and then they got government support. So uh, we also have the biggest uh, Iranian festival in Toronto outside of Iran, uh, an art and culture festival that happens at Harbour Front every year when there's no COVID. Um, City of Toronto is actually one of the big sponsors of that. Um, and that festival alone, it's a three days festival, brings about 150,000 uh, tourists to, to, to town. So yeah, uh, the food is amazing. I would encourage you to, to try it. Um, very easy and pleasing food and very interesting. And mm -hmm. I see a question from Winnie. Um, Winnie, I uh, finished my law school in Iran, so four years. I worked for four years in Iran. I was actually a litigator. Lawyers in Iran, they're generalists. They do everything, family, criminal, contracts. Um, so I used to court in Iran, I used to go to court in Iran regularly. Here I have a bachelor degree and I have a master's degree. My master's in legal studies, but that doesn't give me, um, that, that doesn't designate me as a practicing lawyer in Ontario. I haven't had, I haven't uh, sit for the bar exam in Canada. Any other questions? Um Hi, Tanaya. This Hi. is Adome. Hi. Hi, <laughs> um, Yeah. Thanks for sharing your experience. I just have a have a question regarding the CCLA. Yes. It's that you you provide lots of educational sessions, like educational services. On top of that, what else uh, services that the organization provide to the community? Sure. Uh, so CCLA uh, does education, as you mentioned. We also do lots of report writing. And during this pandemic, we put out a couple of, a couple of reports, including policing during pandemic, uh, ticketing across the country. How was the situation with COVID and ticketing? Uh, we do lots of um, education around privacy, which is a very interesting um, area of civil liberties these days. We do advocacy, so we form campaigns and ask people like you to join us. 
We do make recommendations to the governments to change a law or remove a law. That's what we call uh, legal reform. But for the most part, uh, CCLA is known for bringing charter challenge cases to the court. Some of the cases that you might have heard of um, in Canada, um, it's, one, it's the one about search and confinement. We sued the federal government about uh, seven years ago to end search and confinement, which is a practice that happens in prison where uh, pr prisoners are kept in uh, isolation for a long time. We actually um, won that case in 2020, April 2020, um, just before going to the Supreme Court. Um, there's, there's, because of CCA intervene, intervening, um, we had a cap on social confinement, and that cap was, uh, is 15 days, but it's only recently that it's happening. And another one that we're involved in, these are apart from COVID cases, is uh, a case uh, against the government of Quebec about Bill 21. This is a law that prohibits anyone who works for the provincial government, uh, the government of Quebec in this case, to show any visible religious signs. And we believe, among other interested groups, that this is uh, discriminatory against Muslim women who wear a hijab and Sikh men who wear a turban. Did I answer your questions? Yeah, thank you. It's very yeah. interesting to learn. So, yeah, um, yeah. It, it's very interesting to learn. Thank you. So. Oh, invite me to do a workshop on CCLA for you. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> we'll invite you back later. Please. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right. So okay. now, now I'll turn it over to Cynthia. Thank you, Wang Yang. Thank you. Uh -huh. I see so many different last names uh, in here, English, Mandarin, Cantonese, and I saw a Hakka there too, I think. So, I mean, uh, I really thank you very much for having me today. Actually, tonight uh, I'm going to be sharing with you, actually, my three tenets in life, my mantra, so to speak, mantra. It's very easy to remember, only six words. First one is work hard. Second one is live well, meaning enjoy life. The third one is give back. You don't have to take notes. It's, it should be all in your head, okay? All the new immigrants, when you first come here, you guys must be concurring with what I'm saying here. Is, do you have to work hard? Do you know, we have to work hard. We, I said to people, I have to work hard because twice as hard as a woman, and twice as hard as a visible minority. That's, I have to work four times more hard than other people. So working hard and is, you have to be very, very, there's no, no such thing as overnight success. If you want to be successful, there's no such thing as overnight success. It takes hard work, determination, and a bit of hustling. So I, speaking of hustling, you know, my son, uh, they are, well, I have two sons and both of them are quite um, uh, established and both of them actually made it to, uh, to Forbes 30 under 30. So my, my oldest son, Derek, when he sent to me a happy, happy Mother's Day message on Facebook, he said, happy Mother's Day to my mom, the original hustler. It makes me laugh so hard because, you know, you do have to hustle a little bit if you want to be successful. And the other thing is you have to be committed. You have to commit. When you, do, when you promise to do something, you must commit yourself. If I wanted to, to be a counselor, I have to make a commitment that I really wanted. That's my goal setting. I, after I set my goal, I have to commit to be successful. Commitment, I will tell you a story about commitment. You will remember. It's just the story of the bacon and egg. One day, the chicken and the pig were having a row. They were having a fight. Well, you know, they were having, you know, an argument. The chicken said, you know, I think I work harder than you. Do you know how hard it is to push that egg out? I, I use all my strength, you know, for those women, you know, you have had a baby, you know, you know how hard we have to push to get that baby out. It's very 
hard, work hard. I work hard, tough job. And the, and the pig said, you know, I think I work harder. And she says, the chicken said, why? You were just involved, but I am committed. I don't know whether you get it or not. We have to kill the pig to get the bacon. So, I mean, the chicken is only involved. Like he, she's, not, she's not committed. She's just invo- involved. So that's the story about how, how you have, to, you have to, uh, you know, to, to really commit when you're doing something. And the other thing I wanted to tell you is that you, have to, you must believe in yourself. Like the Toronto uh, Star reporter said, Cynthia Lai believes in Cynthia Lai. You must dare to dream, okay? Even during the day, you can, you can do daydreaming, but it, you, have, you must dare to dream, and the dream is your goal, okay? So you must have an action plan to fulfill your dream so that you could be successful. And also, speaking of that, you must find a job, find something that you enjoy doing, as your job, okay? I have a story to tell about that. When I first come over here, my, my sister said to me, you have to be a professional person, okay? You, you to make life, to make ends meet, to, to make a living, you have to, you have to be, you know, I, I actually study arts in, in Hong Kong, you know? Here, I, I don't know anything about science, you know, the physics, chemistry, all those things is no, I don't, I don't know any of them. But my sister said, in order to make a living here, you have to work in a hospital. Maybe you, ha- you can be a dietitian. You have to take food science. You have to be a doctor. You have to be an engineer. All these things, right? A professional. So I listened to my sister. So I had to when I when I go to great great uh, grade thirteen. We have grade thirteen in those days. Grade thirteen here. I work during the day, and I finish my grade thirteen in the evening because I am a poor immigrant. With my sister and I live in a rooming house in Chinatown with rats and cockroaches. And we have to take turn making dinner. We have to take turn uh, make, uh, going to, uh, to a shower. We have to take turns. So that's how we lived when we first came over here. So my sister said that that's the way to, to do it. But I wanted to tell you, you must find a job that you enjoy. And I've always even said to my, my, my son, my children, and my, my staff now, if you enjoy what you do, you never have to work a day in your life. That is, you have to find the passion. And I, I, I tell you, I have, been, I have been the medical technology, so I, I actually took into biochemistry lab. I work in a hospital for a biochemistry lab for five years, and I, I, I can't stand it. You know why? Because it's just, it's just a job for me, right? We are facing all this machine, testing, testing all the blood sugar and all these, you know, all these things from medical lab, you know, that's in that surrounding and I have to work shift work. I don't, I didn't enjoy it. So, but when my, my dad got cancer, I had to be in and out of the hospital and it hit me, it really hit me. So, and my, and, and then my next job would, you wouldn't believe my next job is a flight attendant. So I actually went to. I, I have so many jobs, I'm telling you. I mean, I, I, I ended up in, 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 in to be a, a counselor, but I was a flight attendant because I, I was very sick of my job. It's too monotonous, so I went to learn French, okay? And I don't know why. I thought because it's, a, you know, Toronto is, a, I mean, Canada is a, you know, it's a bilingual country. Maybe I should, I should go and learn French. So I did. And, it, it, and then part-time, I did some travel, uh, travel counseling, just as, um, as my interest, I love, I love, to, I love to travel. So I, when, I, when I go to interview for the French uh, school, the Berlitz School of Languages, the interviewer said to me, I really like you. Well, if you're gonna be my teacher of Chinese, then you can get a staff rate of French. I can, you know, you get a staff rate to learning French. I said, fine, wow, why not? So, uh, so I, I, I had agreed to be trained to be a, Chinese instructor, Cantonese instructor. That was in the 80s. So at that time, you know, people like to learn Cantonese uh, at, at that time because, you know, uh, so I said, okay, fine. And then we, had, we went to training 
And then I see all my peers. They are one day during lunch hour, they were all doing something. I said, what are you doing? They said, well, we're applying for flight attendant. We're applying for airlines. You want to come? You know, this is kind of peer pressure. I said, okay, 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 let's go, let's go. So I put in application. I apply for World Air. I apply for CP Air. I mean, those two, two, two airlines are already defunct, okay? CP Air was merged with Air Canada. So, so I, I said, okay, let's go. So, so I, I got in. I was lucky. I mean, you know, I got in and, and, and after flight attendant, they laid me off. So they laid me off and I said, what am I going to do now? I can have a, an option of going back to the hospital. I don't like it. I really don't like it. So what I did was I said, let me go to travel because I enjoy travel, right? So I enjoy travel. So I went to travel. And then it was 1985 when, you know, the Hong Kong issue with the 1997, a lot of people coming to Canada to kind of seek out for the immigrant. You know, they all wanted to immigrate to China uh, from, from Hong Kong to here. So one day I, I actually uh, took them around city tour of Toronto and go to Niagara Falls. And I was a tour guide, actually. I, I, I mean, I took a job as a tour guide after I was a flight attendant. And then at the end of the four days I was with them, they said, Cynthia, do you know somebody who can sell real estate? I said, what? Real estate? Oh, I said, why? You know, the whole bus load. We're all here. We're going to be immigrating from Hong Kong to Canada in six months. Can you find us a good, a good real estate agent? You know what I said? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Six months, okay? You find me. I will be your real estate agent, okay? So within that six months, I changed a profession to be a real estate agent. And Ever since that, I never looked back. Okay. So basically, I found my job that I like. You know, with a, you know, with a biochemistry job, it's just like testing your blood and, you know, blood sugar and your, you know, all these, your urine, your, you know, is, is a testing. It's, it's nothing. It's not a people business. But then with a flight attendant, you know, it's serving people. It's a people business. And I find like, I like it. You know, imagine. For those people who came six months later, they actually, I bought all of them houses. You know why? It's all about like and trust. I always, when I do my training, I'm, I am actually a faculty member of the Real Estate Institute of Canada, you know, for the, for the um, fellow of real estate. I teach them communications and uh, negotiation. So I told them, if people like you, they will trust you. You can sell anything to them. So that is working hard. So realtor is to helping people finding their dream home, right? And counselor is to help people and be their voice to government. So this is, I found my niche. I found my passion because I really enjoy helping people. I enjoy serving people. So those so much are hard work. So I ended up, there's in, in between, there's tons of stories, but I'm not going to share. I mean, I can, I can be all day and all night here. But let me move to my second. The second of my mantra is live well. Live well, meaning you have to enjoy life, right? And then after that, I started a family. So with my two sons, you have to enjoy life with them. I wanted to tell you, for those of you who are working, you must commit yourself to balance your work with your family life because your children is just like your investment. You put, how much money you put in the bank, and at the end of the day, when you grow older, you will get out so, many, so much money from them. It's like an investment. If you don't, if you don't uh, you know, uh, stay with them and you don't grow up with them and you're just going to work, you will get nothing. So what I usually do is when I uh, live well, you know, when I have my, my, my family, I take my children Every holiday, summer, March break, Christmas, three trips away from Toronto. Very important. People ask me, how do you teach your children to be so successful, to be, to make it to the Forbes 30 and the 30? I said, look, I never, never teach them. I just show it to them. And you just communicate your value to them when you are traveling with them. That's very important. Because, you know, you're gonna, you, 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 will, you will share your value with them when you are traveling with them. That is because, you know, if you stay in Toronto, 
you're going to be too busy for them. So make a point to leave Toronto. Leave, okay? And enjoy life. One is your family. You know, my, my son, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me share with you a face, another Facebook message of my, my, my son, okay? Uh, he is very important because you teach them something that cannot learn from, from books. And uh, every Mother's Day, they sent me stuff and I sometimes I will I will uh, share with them share with people my son my oldest son one day he said you know the original hustler the next year he wrote to me happy mother's day thank you happy mother's day to you to my mom who inspires me to be a better person every day and teaches me the importance of love, family, commitment, and perseverance. See, I never taught them these things, but you know what? I never said, you have to be perseverant, you have to be, you know, love is important. And remember I said, you have to commit and persevere. And uh, so, so that is to live well, is to travel a lot, enjoy traveling and enjoy time with the family and, and you have to dress, right? Dress for success. I enjoy shopping and I enjoy dressing nicely. But you know what? The dress is about confidence, right? You dress yourself well is your self-confidence too. But the most beautiful attire is a smile. Smile. So it's most beautiful. It doesn't matter. So that's why I wanted to see your smiling face here. So very important. These are the things. And the third one, this is the second one is live well, enjoy life, right? The third mantra that I have is to give back. You've seen my resume, my bio. I am a volunteer of this. I'm a volunteer here. You know, every hospital fundraising, everything. I, I take part. You know, you have no idea. People have said, how much time? How, how, come, how come you find so much time to volunteer? I said, look. You just take volunteer as work. And you know why? You build your own network. And I always said, your network is your net worth. The more network you build, the more time you spend volunteering. You have no idea. I was actually, because you know, you expose yourself. I was actually volunteering in the Realtors Care Foundation, Shelter Foundation. I was chair in that. And there was this uh, real estate agent from London, Ontario. He, see, because of volunteer, we have to meet, right? A lot of times we meet and he likes me so much. He refer a business from, from a developer, come, come from Windsor to Toronto. You will have no idea how much money I made from that for sitting in that board for a volunteer position. I've made in folds. I've made so much money. Don't say that is a waste of time volunteering. You build your network, you, and that is your net worth because you show people how you work and people will, give, give, will send you business. And that's how things go around and round and round. All right, that's it. Giving back, important. But I want to leave you with the last paragraph that the Toronto Star reporter wrote in that article I told you about uh, when I first got elected, he, she said, from poverty to prosperity. That is my story. From poverty to prosperity. And then she said, Cynthia has the energy and drive and people skill to get things done. That's what she said. She only know me for two, for an hour of interview. And then she kind of sends, because you know, that's my, that's my story tells. I wanted to leave you with two thoughts. Okay. The first one is when life is sweet, say thank you and celebrate. And when life is bitter, say thank you and grow. We must say thanks. We must be thankful. We must treat every day as Thanksgiving. That is my first slide. My second slide, please. Second slide, slide I want to share with you is success is in the next exit. The ability is what you are capable of doing. 
Motivation determines what you do, and attitude determines how well you do it. And I wanted to tell everybody: you must be a visionary. You have to dare to dream. You must must believe in yourself, and you must be a visionary. The story about the being a visionary is like playing hockey. I don't know how many of you know Wayne Gretzky. Tonight is the Maple Leafs playing,、uh, you know, the the、uh, the playoff. Wayne Gretzky is a very very is a superstar. What he says to, he has a very favorite line that I wanted to quote and share with you. I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going. Thank you. Those are my words. And also, maybe just a final, final story about be like a swan. You know the swan when you see them on the water, it's very, very calm and elegant. You know why is it that I have to be like a swan? Is to stay cool and calm above, but pedal like hell underneath. Thank you. Those are my words. Two minutes over over time. Sorry. Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> You are such a vigorous, ambitious woman. So that's as I guess that's why you grow from poverty to prosperity. <laughs> Thank you for sharing the story. So, since yeah, like you said, you have、um, yeah. I asked this uh, uh, to Talia.、Uh, how about you? Like,、uh, what kind of barrier can you share with us? A、uh, story, like、uh, the barrier you encountered. This my、culture. barrier,、mm-hmm. my barrier to this day, is the language barrier.、Mm-hmm. To this day, I'm still overcoming it every day. I am, I won't just like you guys are shy. You don't want to turn your camera, but I'm shy of talking. I talk. I don't talk too much, and then people thought maybe you don't know anything. But you know what? I said I don't talk. I don't say too much, but it doesn't mean that I don't know what's going on. So my barrier is still is still. Uh, my 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 speech, my 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 talking, because you know, you see, you lose your mother tongue because you've been away from your from your motherland for so long. But then, in the meantime, you know, you're sort of like halfway between. My English is not as not really perfect, and nor is my Chinese. So I'm just like in the no man land, you know. So I think、uh, to this day, I'm still I'm still overcoming my barriers. It's about my language barrier, and like just like speaking on council. You know、uh, how you don't want people. When I first come here, a lot of people. I I I actually took it very took offense to some people when when they always say, "Pardon me, pardon me." They, you know, all the time when you say something, they don't know what it is. But I've learned over the years to speak slowly. Then people will understand you better. So try to speak slowly. Then you know that's one of the ways that I learn from. You know, from overcoming all these barriers all my life in 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 a country that、uh, with English being you know not being my my mother tongue.、Mm-hmm. So you're still、um, you still feel you have this language uh, uh, barrier. Then, then how do you like? In addition to speaking uh, slowly, uh, what what can you do to make it up? Like as city councilor, I would imagine you have a lot of things. To do, you need to maybe persuade your colleague to do something together with you. How how do you do that? Well, you just you just have to keep practicing, right? You just have to don't be afraid to 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 to, to try. You know, you just have to. You know, some some colleagues they they will respect you, and they even though they don't understand you a hundred percent, they will pretend they understand you, and then they will repeat. Is it what you mean, right? Then that will make you feel better, feel so much better. But some some people will just say hi, Shirley. <laughs> some people will just say, "Oh, pardon me, right?" So this is、uh, you just have to keep practicing. I think practice makes perfect. I actually shared this with one of my colleagues on council, like、uh, Councillor Cole. He was an MPP, and then I share with him. I he's Italian, and I share with him. You know, I I'm a little bit still not very easy speaking on council. And you know what he says to me? He says, "Cynthia." Practice makes perfect. Try to speak on one item each time on council. It doesn't matter how much you know. I mean, stage fright or you know you can't really say it well, and you you're not being very expressive. But just still do it. And I think I'm I'm getting better now. 
getting better, you know, getting better. So mm-hmm. practice makes perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think to try to do things well <laughs> would be very extremely important um, for people who do not s- speak the language. Yeah. So you, you use the language of doing <laughs> action. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think you want to say mm-hmm. so. Is that right? Um, so um, I I have this question for both of our mm-hmm. guest speakers, so Tally and Cynthia, because um, uh, today in a WeChat group uh, I saw um, some uh, people that are talking about this discrimination. Um, have you ever encountered discrimination in a country? Like how? What is the story and uh, how did you deal with them? Well, Wang Yang, if you want yeah. to hear that, mm-hmm. you, have, you have another session for me. I got countless okay. stories for you. Countless. Okay. Countless story. So, so maybe I go to Atelia the first and then you can uh, think of a, a short story for us too, Cynthia. So tell uh, I will. I will. Yeah, tell you first, and I will tell you. I tell you one story. Okay. Yeah. Are we talking about discrimination in Canada, or are we talking yeah. about discrimination in oh, Canada? Sure. Because in, in Iran, like uh, as Councillor said, mm-hmm. the, the incidents are um, mm-hmm. are endless. But what I find in Canada, and uh, the Councillor is right, you know, things have changed uh, significantly. I find. But it doesn't mean that Canada is not a racist country. Uh, it's it means that we are we're just better at hiding it. So something that happened uh, to me at the beginning uh, when I wasn't speaking English, not that I speak it well, you know, it's this is a lifelong struggle for all of us immigrants. Um, you're never going to be perfect in any language. But what I also remember is that this is not my, the only language I speak. So maybe that's why I'm so confident because I also know that, you know, um, at least I'm speaking one language in addition to the English speaking person. But something that happened to me uh, at the beginning uh, of like doing a job is that I went for an interview and after I finished the interview, it was for like a mid-level management position. They asked me to, uh, and again, like remember, this is not, this was not my English at the time. And um, they asked me to go upstairs to an off profit organization who claimed that they wanted uh, racialized women, women who are minorities, mm-hmm. And the woman said, okay, sit here. And they asked me to take a language test, which is a discrimination um, based on the Ontario Human Rights Code, but I didn't know at the time. And this was not in the interview process, but I feel like because I had an accent, they asked me to do that. Um, it was very uh, belittling, right? After I left and was like, oh, like, was it because the interview panel was all white women and they're just like not using the... F- um, having someone speaking with an accent because uh, even though my English was not that good, but I still, you know, I had my TOEFL test. I passed with uh, glorious remarks and, you know, I was studying English at the time, uh, English literature at university at the time. So yes, um, again, like subtle racism still to this day happens, like these types of discrimination. Um, and like what? Uh, like say subtle, subtle. So well, like what? Hidden, hidden, well, hidden. Right? Like they're not asking you. They're not directly looking at you, saying things, but they're implying that because you are from another country, because you look a certain way, um, you know, you should be. You are different. One of the things that I repeatedly hear I, to this day is that you must be grateful that you live in this country. And it's not that I'm not grateful, but that doesn't mean that I still don't, I still work hard enough to make this country better, right? Uh, when I talk about violence against women, this is unfortunately a global issue. And Canada is not in a better situation than a country, like other countries. We have better laws, but the culture is not that different. And it's not like people in Iran, Iranian men are committed violence against women, but Canadian men aren't. So, um, you know, th- those types of standards that, okay, you're coming from a country that maybe the culture is not as good, which is not true, by the way, you must have, like, you must grow up with different standards or you must have different values. And because now you're here, you should be Canadianized. You ha- there are certain, um, you should be modernized. That's what I'm going to put it. 
Well, I always just just so about uh, people are making fun of my accent. You know, I sometimes I do a consolation to myself. I said, you know, I even ask them back question. Okay, if you can speak Chinese as good as I speak English, then you make fun of me, and then they'll just shut up. After that, okay. So basically, that's sometimes my 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 take on that one. And speaking of uh, discrimination, you know, I I take it as my motivation. Every time I'm discriminated upon, it motivates me to go higher, to reach a higher. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, I I after I become the I was the first woman, uh, the first. Women of Asian descent that make it to the president of the Toronto Real Estate Board in its 100 years history. I was the fifth woman, the first Chinese woman, to become their president, and it was because of grassroots, because of grassroots voting, just like voting grassroots. Everybody has vote, and you know what I did? I plan. I I set this goal 10 years before I reached this goal. Before every year, I go and sit on a different committee, so that people will get to know me, and then that's how I got elected. And then when I wanted to move higher to be the Ontario Real Estate Council, I I was elected three terms director there. I wanted to be chair of that council. I failed two times because they're all Anglo people sitting in the table. They're not being a grassroots vote voting, you know. Only the Anglo. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I, I am. I might be saying by saying that I might be discriminating upon the Anglo people, but that's how that was the reality when I was, you know, what I was being encountered. I feel like two times I could not even get elected because nobody will vote for me. And then the very quick one more one more story was, uh, Councilor Kelly actually asked me, you know, remember. I, I said that volunteer, right? Give back to the community. So Council Kelly recruited me to sit on the Committee of Adjustment for the City of Toronto in the Scarborough panel in the year 2010. I, I, lo- I was lucky you know, because he endorsed me. That's why I got into the committee. It's not easy to get into all these committees. So I got in because of him. He's my mentor. So I sat on there for four years. In, t- in 2014, I reapply to be reappointed and Scarborough. Can you see that Scarborough is a very Chinese? We have 50% Chinese people living in Scarborough and I didn't get reappointed. And then later on, I asked, I asked them why. And then Councillor uh, Kelly was saying that they were saying, you know, people were saying that you're not doing a good job or maybe you are too much a pro development or something. Like those are some reason that he gave me. But, you know, guess what? It motivated me to run for counselor. If you don't think I'm good, I'll show you I'm good. So I went, I, I, I went to, you know, run for counselor because nobody wants me to sit in the committee. So those are the two stories that actually quite stand out about, I thought, being discriminated. And, and there's tons, tons of stories I can tell. Like I said, I can talk all evening about all these examples of being discriminated. Yeah. Okay. Wang Yang. Okay, thank you. So, uh, some people say, uh, like uh, within our own communities, um, the discrimination um, when you encounter them, like uh, you need to think about yourself, like reflect on yourself. Like, say, for example, in Chinese community, maybe there are, you know, some Chinese Asians. They they do not get to learn a lot about Canadian culture. So maybe they do not behave um, very well or elegantly or communicate in an acceptable way. So that causes, like partly (laughs) causes, uh, cause this discrimination. And maybe, I don't know, uh, Talia, um, in Iranian community, uh, maybe there's some people, or or I say, I, I mean, Iranian community, they have different uh, religions, right? Um, Christian, Muslim, uh, a, a lot of religions there. Uh, but do you have the same um, question from either within the community 
or outside the community? Like, uh, what do you see your own problem uh, and how do you address them? And how do you see that uh, with this general discrimination against the whole, you know, community? Like, what would, would be your answers to those kind of questions? Um, so I definitely cannot speak for the Iranian community, uh, but mm -hmm. generally, um, you know, I, I see many people coming in. Um, I don't see that. I, I, I would see this as a, like a difference of culture. I don't think necessarily one is worse than the others. Um, as the counselor said, associating with other people really helps. Like these days with link classes, the language educational programs that wasn't, they didn't exist at, at my time. Um, they do teach students, they talk about, you know, cultural differences in Canadian culture. Um, I, I, I see that as a barrier as, you know, integrating into society, like getting jobs, the culture, the, the work culture for sure is very different uh, for us Iranians. Um, and uh, even like promoting yourself or selling yourself when you are in job market, it's a huge barrier, especially when it comes to immigrant women. Um, most of us coming from very uh, cultures that you have to be modest about your skills and, you know, values. And uh, even if you're super educated, you have to say like, oh, I did nothing, you know, like you have to be very modest. And this types of like change happens over time um, about not only promoting yourself, but also learning to promote your community. And like these mentorship programs are excellent ways of talking to people. Right now, for example, I have Truth Triac. I have, you know, I'm in contact with this incredible woman from Kenya. She has a PhD degree, multiple degrees. She was a, a executive director of a couple of not-for-profit organizations back in her country. She's here and it's really hard for her to get a job. And it's not because of her values or because of her skills. She brings in unbelievable experience to the job market. But, you know, that whole thing of saying, well, you have to have a Canadian experience, even though she worked in a much difficult situation when it comes to, you know, human situation. Um, you know, she still has to learn about like interview skills and how to how do you how you market yourself to the Canadian market. And I think that's one of the biggest barriers that any community, regardless of where you come from, um, um, that happens. And I know that it's comfortable to be with your own peers, with groups of people, um, but um, that's a really good advice to try to find other friends. They don't necessarily have to be Canadians. They can be from other cultures. And if you are an open and warm culture, open, like invite them to your homes or learn about their culture. I don't feel like anyone takes offense if you ask questions at someone who's curious and is trying to learn uh, as someone who's not trying to be judgmental about uh, the ways of living of a different culture. And, you know, like these are some of the things that we can all do and we can all um, improve when we open our doors and our hearts to other people. I agree. Thank you. And Cynthia, do you have something there to say? Like, uh, what kind of problems do you see uh, in the Chinese community? Well, that, uh, you know, um, form a kind of barrier for ourselves. You know, I think I've always believed in that. If we do not want discrimination, we, will, we should not discriminate on anybody. That is the first thing to do. And I just want to share you an, another story. Uh, one day I was in my community office. Some people, there's some lady who speaks Mandarin, uh, walk close by. And then I, I was, well, you know, I being born in Hong Kong, but my, uh, you know, my heritage is, is Shenzhen. You know, it's in Shenzhen. I'm, I'm actually from mainland, but because I was born in Hong Kong. And then she says to me, oh, you mean you're from Shenzhen? Oh, I didn't know. I thought you were from Hong Kong. Oh, we should, then we should, we should support you. So I was just re reading between the lines, even with, among the Chinese people, ourselves, there's discrimination somewhere there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know who it is, but like I said, I've always believed in, if you do not want to discriminate people, you know, you just, you don't, I mean, you don't want to be discriminated. 
then you shouldn't be discriminated. To me, I've always believed that there's, there's only one race, the human race. It doesn't matter where you're from, like Hong Kong. It doesn't matter Hong Kong, you're, you're Chinese, you're from Hong Kong, you're from mainland, or you're from Macau, you're from Taiwan. We're all Chinese. We're all one race. We're all Chinese. So we, we, should, we shouldn't be saying that, oh, you are, you're from Taiwan, then I, I, I'm not going to support you. Like, those are the things that we shouldn't be doing. Like Hakka people, I tell you, we're Hakka. I'm Hakka. Hakka people are the most people that persevere so much, you know, because they travel from different places, from one place to another. That's why they call Hakka, is that they, they, they have so much perseverance, you know, they have tolerance, and they work so hard. Those are the Hakka uh, values, right? I saw Li Shen she, uh, nodding her head because these are the type of things. It doesn't matter where you're from. We are all one race. We are all from China. We are Chinese, right? So basically, I think that's what I've learned and that's what I think that we shouldn't be doing. You know, it doesn't matter where you're from. And I try myself to be inclusive. You know, it doesn't matter what, you know, from main, mainland and and. You know, Li Shen, I really thank you very much for introducing Wang Yang to me, you know, because I actually knock, knock at her door and then we become, we become friends. You know, that's, you that's, how, we, that's how we met. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. how we met. And, and Li Shen, you, you want to say something? Mm, I, you know, for me, since you're 2014, yeah, you're yes. being like a candidate for the city council. Yeah? Yeah. You are really inspiring me. You're, you're uh, your personal character uh, give me so many stress, you know, I, for, from you, I learned so many things. And then like, and later when I met Wang Yang, I feel uh, Wang Yang and you very similar, the character, want to be a leader. They say good leader doing the right things. That's very important, you know, the, for the good leader. Yeah, Some leader is not doing the right things, but you and Wang Yang is a good leader doing the right things. So, I said, I have to introduce you and Wang Yang together because you're you a good leader. You can make people more, um, more unity. That's what just you say, Chinese, always be unity. I heard Wang Yang from the CPC radio for the talking about the, for COVID 19 during the COVID 19 mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. I feel like so, in, you know, in my feeling, I, I cannot express my, my feeling, mm. but I feel so proud for Wang oh. Yang and our <laughs> Chinese community. Yes, that's true. Even I, I have so many friends. I still said our uh, Scarborough Council. I said uh, for sincere life is our best council. I said I, I learned so many things. Even I, I didn't, you know, speaking in the, our WeChat, but I read every day. I knew everything <laughs> you did. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm uh, that is that is that is work hard. Council, yeah. that is yeah. work hard, right? Uh, my number uh, one, yeah. my number one mantra: you must work uh, hard uh, for your community. <laughs> So, yeah, that, yeah, like, that's my people, like for, of all heritages, <laughs> we need to work together. Like uh, yes. Iranian, Chinese, uh, every everybody. We are um, Canadians. Yes. We are Canadians. Yeah, we are yes. Canadian. Yeah, that's true. We are Canadian. <laughs> we want our country more better. You know, we build our countries better. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter you where you come from. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. because we like here. We choose here. But that means we like it here. Then we are right here. You have to. Making a more better place for, for living. Mm. That's that's why mm. we are moved moved to here. That's that's why I'm thinking. <laughs> so that's for mm -hmm. us. We always say doing your better things every day. You try your best. Then you make. It doesn't yeah. matter how little things you did, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have things of the kind of things you do. So mm. yeah, if I may suggest you 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 Google a YouTube on YouTube a song called Toronto, just Toronto, and okay. that was written written by my friend Andy De Campus who's a Portuguese, oh. he's a Portuguese, and his okay. wife is a Chinese. And oh. one of the lyrics, the lyrics in there says, Toronto, don't care where you're from. That is, that <laughs> is the lyrics. Dream. That's <laughs> that is, that is the lyrics that uh, well, they, they thank wrote. You. Uh -huh. Thank you. And, and I wonder, is there any, uh, anybody in the audience um, have any question for Talia or Cynthia? Um. I actually have a question for Councillor Sincere. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, Dame. Yeah. Um, first, of all, thank you for sharing your, your models. That's really, it's very inspiring. And I just have a question because um, you mentioned something. You mentioned the first one, work hard, no problem. The Chinese and the immigrants community, many of us work super hard. 
but I was just bothered with one thing. So I said, if you are, if you are likable or being liked by people, they trust you. Somehow I, I'm kind of puzzled here. Like if you work hard, doesn't mean that you, you may be liked. Um, sometimes my lead to the opposite effect. So what are the secret you have, like, you know, being liked by people? <laughs> that is a very, very good question, Dome. Uh, being liked by people is not easy. Okay, that's why. Even like you're right. How much, how much hard you work. If people don't like you, they just don't like you. So I think the secret is be humble and, uh, well, smile. Always smile. Have a positive attitude. You know, I've always tell people, my blood type is be positive. Always be possible. Uh, be positive and always have a good attitude, then, then people will like you. I'll give you an example. I walk into a car dealership. I wanted to buy a car. But if I don't like the salesman, do you think I'm going to buy a car from him? No, right? So that's the example. And then the other, the other, another time, I didn't want to buy a, a, a condominium. But if I walk into the sales center, I like the guy. Well, I mean, I'm just exaggerating. I mean, you, you might not want to buy a condominium because of that. I actually told my husband, I bought this one for my birthday. It was my birthday. I actually walked into a sales center and I loved that condominium, you know, for, for, for an investment. It's very like a very, in those days, it's still quite cheap condominium, right? So I said, because I like the person, I want to buy something from him. That's how it is. That is, you know, the secret is just be positive. Or always smile and that's it. Keep smiling. You know, the other story is, I, if I don't smile, I'm very serious. And then my salespeople, I was manager for Royal Page. My salespeople walk in front of my office. Say, Cynthia, you look very serious. Do you want to smile? Do you want, can you smile more? Do you know what I did? I brought, a ca I brought a mirror and put it in front of my desk. Every time I look at the mirror and I look, oh my God, I'm so ugly. Oh, I'm not smiling. And every time you look at yourself, smile. And that's why people say, you're always smiling now. Because I, I, I mean, I, was, I wasn't born to be always smiling. You just have to train yourself to be, you know, put a mirror. I even told my, my staff now, when you're on the phone, put a mirror there. You have to smile into the phone. Then people will like you. <laughs> that's does that help? Does, does that help? That that's your health secret. So how about you, Talia? How 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 do you? What's your uh, secret of being oh. liked? <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm liked that much, but um, I think Ooh, I like you. I, oh, thank, I you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I to you. Um, I also smile a lot for sure. <laughs> Gaging, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I think um, really listening and not just pretending that you listen. So active listening is also a big part. Uh, something that I've learned with community work, if you claim that you are helping them, you should start by listening to them and uh, actually take those, uh, those things that they tell you in consideration. Um, and it doesn't matter what age they are. Uh, you know, when I tell you that I do talk to many young people, um, and this is not an exaggeration, they find our presentation very engaging and, and interesting because we don't treat them like children. We treat them like people who should know about their rights, right? So our presentation is often um, 30 to 40 questions, like really easy questions, so you really get, in, get them engaged. And um, I, I tell them that uh, you have many interested parties who want to limit your rights, with good reasons, if you have parents or if you have, you have you know, teachers um, that want to limit your rights, sometimes it's with good intention. Most of the times it, they're trying to limit your rights because they're trying to keep you safe. But sometimes you might think that these limitations are not fair and you want to advocate for yourself. So that's why I'm here. I'm here to tell you options. And anytime you feel, you're be you feel like you're being mistreated, you can speak up and talk about unfairness. 
And that's what, you know, maybe it's the first time that someone is telling them, uh, you know, we, many of us parents, we just make up rules and we say, this is what it is. And you have to obey them without explaining why, what are we trying to do? Something that I'm, I'm guilty of as a parent. So, you know, I try to explain that you should know the reasons and you should also see if you are unfair um, that, you know, maybe you should be called out for. Believe me, my children's now, because they had these workshops, now they do that to me. They ask for reasons. And I was like, maybe you should change your rules or maybe you should revise them because we don't think you're being fair. And sometimes I'm tired and I'm not being fair. So it's good to uh, have a ch check and balance system, actually. Mm -hmm. be fair <laughs> be fair <Yeah. laughs> and i i heard someone raised uh his or her hand i cannot yeah, see I so think it's but zehra uh, if i'm not mistaken uh, yeah that's yeah. me hi everyone um, hi, i am everyone. turkish and, hi, zehra. You know, hi hello there um, i am turkish and i have a different perspective yes we should love people but at the same time each people is not trustworthy in my opinion like I have a different perspective. Like when I was in high school, um, I had lots of friends that I, I, I really loved and took care of them. At the end of the day, we broke the relationship, unfortunately, as a result. They did something that not trustworthy. And I feel like most people not trustworthy, but some of the people I think is trustworthy. Hmm. Like I have a different perspective about this. Mm -hmm. What are you, what what is your opinion? I think this is something that we all aware of in terms of you know. Um, I think what Councillor Rai was trying to explain was mm -hmm. the secret of being successful or being uh, you know liked as a politician for sure yeah. is to smile and um, you know try to gain people's trust. That's my understanding, Councillor. Am I wrong about that? Yeah, be sincere. Yes. And be honest. <laughs> so, be honest. Never tell, and, you know, yeah. honest. Everything has to be honest. Yeah. Tell so it doesn't, doesn't mean mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you uh, trust people because you want to have like a close relationship with them. But I think definitely as a politician, it helps if you can, you feel like you trust them or you have a good feeling about them or and if you are a leader in an organization uh, to gain that trust. So it wasn't about, I, I don't think the advice was for you to go around and trust everyone, mm -hmm. but uh, as someone who is going to be in a position of authority or is in a position of authority, it's good to gain trust and not in a malicious way, but in a good way, uh, be sincere and gain that trust. Yeah. What is First the of all, malicious, by the way? Sorry? What is the meaning of malicious? Oh, I malicious. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a good good one. And malicious means like you're mean or you have ways to trick people uh, to gain their trust. I think the, sen the counselor was dishonest. saying that, yeah, dishonest. Like you should be sincere and get people's trust. Just okay. like, you know, Li Shan, I mean, the, you only have two minutes to, to make the first impression. People will judge you whether they will like you in the first two minutes, right? Li Shan, like, you know, when you first meet me, two minutes, you, you feel that you, you can like me and then you start building up the relationship, right? And that's very interesting. It only takes two minutes to bring, you know, the first impression and then you can build the trust after. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Just to come on to here, so if, you got that impression in first two minutes. I mean, many cases it's true. And then, so the smiling is very important to make that impression. <laughs> yes. You know, if you have to be very genuine, people will see you. Like, you know, I think the other word would be probably you have to be, be yourself, right? Like be very genuine, sincere. I think that is the word for it. You know, people will, will feel it when they when they think that you're not malicious, right? You're saying that, you know, that is fake. You, people say, see that you're fake. A lot of people have, can judge people quick, uh, very, you know, I think as times go by, as you grow, you can judge people more easily than when you are younger. So I think it comes with age. <laughs> <laughs> and I also think that, and that may be something that can be trained as well. Cause many people say, okay, the Chinese people are, look very serious. 
somehow, I don't know, for whatever reason, like, uh, you know, many Chinese people or immigrants, uh, especially from mainland, can, uh, mainland China, I, I, I can say, you know, it, it's kind of true. You know, many of them look really serious. Yeah, yeah, do, you see that? do you see that? Do you feel like uh, we're too serious faces? <laughs> no, <laughs> Dome is always smiling. She opened the camera, she's smiling already. <laughs> I, I, I noticed the many, many people from main can, mainland China, sorry, mainland China, look pretty serious, really. Well, uh, I know, I look pretty serious. I have a serious face. <laughs> I think because <laughs> the curve of my mouth is like downward, <laughs> so it takes more like a uh, strength to smile. Yeah. You know, that is trainable, Dome. You know why? Because <laughs> yeah. when I was serious, I was like very strict. And then I train myself to smile. So it's trainable. Actually, it's, coach, it's coachable. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's trainable. Yeah, yes. Some but people... you, you, know, you know what? Um, I think also uh, we, uh, you come from a country of a long, long history. So maybe something there. Um, but Iran <laughs> is also <laughs> a, a, a country of long, long history. I was going to say that uh, I used to joke that I know other Iranians women and trust me, between us, there are many people, kind of like Turkish people, that they're fair skinned, they have blue eyes, they have, you know, blonde hair, they don't look Iranian at all. But the way that I can tell them, it's the way that we hold our jaws when we walk in the street. We also look very serious, I find, non-smiling. And I think it's because, like, because of like continuous harassment or catcalling in the street, you're just like you hold yourself in a certain way when you walk in the street. Um, when I go back to Iran, they know I'm from somewhere else because I smile too much. They're like, "Oh, you, you're Iranian, but you don't live here," just because the way that I'm like too friendly, maybe. Um, and I don't, I don't hold that against people necessarily. I think this is how we are born and raised. I also have many Chinese friends and I never thought of them as very serious. I actually enjoy their sense of humor. Um, you know, I, when I met you young, I didn't think that you are unfriendly or, you know, you don't smile as much. Um, but I think this is, you know, something that definitely gets you places <laughs> when you're friendly yeah. and you smile for I, sure. That's um, what I, I, I mean, like uh, people from a country of long history, maybe they, there's some, uh, uh, um, heavy like heaviness <laughs> yeah. written in the gene. <laughs> uh, I once had a an American student, like he learned Chinese um, uh, with me, and he said, "Oh, you know what? I can tell Europeans from Americans." I say, "How do you tell?" Like to me, they look the same. But he said, "Okay, like Europeans when they walk, like they walk like." You know, they're about <laughs> low, like uh, very, very serious um, faces, but Americans, they were like, just, oh, <laughs> you know, very open, like a happy. Happy uh, go lucky. That's true. Yeah. So, so I guess yeah. that's something like with the history. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> it's like we carry the weight of the word on our shoulder. <laughs> that's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> okay. You're right. right. <laughs> so, so, well, thank you so much, uh, Cynthia and Talia. Uh, uh, for your speeches and sharing your stories. Um, they're, they're inspirational. Um, thank you. And um, well, I, I have to respect the time. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll, we'll call it a day. So I wish everybody to uh, a, a very good night. Okay. And uh, thank we, you. nice yeah, talking thank to you, you and meeting you all. Take care yeah, of yourself. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Yang, for organizing this.